week on Sneak Previews, we review Summer's Baby. That's the haunting romance about a returning Confederate soldier with Richard Gere and Jodie Foster. And a family find matinee with John Goodman as an outrageous producer of campy horror flicks. And Sniper with Tom Berenger as a trained killer on a secret mission. Plus two other titles on this week's Sneak Previews. Daddy, son. Come on, Dan. Hello, Robert. That was Richard Gere, who's just come back after six years away fighting in the Civil War and serving time in a federal prison camp to reunite with his wife, played by Jodie Foster, and their son on a ruined plantation in Tennessee. But it turns out that his homecoming raises all kinds of troubling questions in Summersby, which is one of the five titles we cover on this week's Sneak Previews. I'm Michael Medved. And I'm Jeffrey Lyons. And in Summersby, amid all the ruin and desolation left by the Civil War, Foster notices that some things about their life seem to be better than before. The damn house is falling apart. <laughs> what? Us. One balance. <laughs> I was just thinking how we used to be, all rich and stupid. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Now this house is falling apart and all broke, and I've never been so happy. <laughs> Certainly have changed, haven't you? For the better? <laughs> so much better, it scares me sometimes. Six but here's identity is questioned by a neighbor, Bill Pullman, who'd loved Foster all during the war. A man comes here, says he's your husband. You say I have to make way. I'm making it. I eat my own heart like a piece of spoiled meat, but I make way for you. Then I run into these drifters. They've just been at your place looking for work, and one of them's got his neck cut. Said that somebody claiming to be Jack Summersby tried to kill him. I said, why'd he try to kill you? He said, because he knew it wasn't Jack. Said he'd been with the real Jack when he got his chest tore up at Wilson Creek, and this man didn't have a mark on him. And just now, out in the field, he didn't know who Ham says was. Best friend he ever had. Didn't know Ham said. But you've known all along, haven't you? Hmm? He might have fooled us, but he didn't fool you. Why, Laura? Why'd you do it? Why'd you take him into your house? into your bed. And why in God's name are you carrying some stranger's child when all I ever wanted in this world was to honor you? You are living in mortal sin, mortal summer's being. Do you love me? You're drunk. Yeah. Eventually, the questions about his identity lead to this confrontation. I love you. Now, do you love me? If you loved me, you would stop this sinning and you would leave me alone. No, no. I will not. Well, Jack would. Sure that would, wouldn't it? Do you know him? Is he dead? All I know, you killed him and you left him in some ditch somewhere. He's right here. He's right here in front of you, right now. Right here in front of you. A little banged up, maybe, but I'm here. Stop it! Shh! Oh, stop it! Wake the boy. Oh, stop it. You're making me crazy! Are you 
Get out of this house! I don't think Richard Gere has ever been as good as he is in this picture right here. I mean, he has one of the most difficult assignments an actor can ever have. He has to give a performance where there are two totally legitimate but contradictory interpretations of what's going on with him, and he brings it off wonderfully. Well, if the plot sounds familiar to people who saw the movie The Return of Martin Gare with Gerald Depardieu a few years ago, it is. This is kind of an Americanized version of it with the same things going on. But even though I saw that movie, I don't know how many people saw it nationwide. It's a I saw wonderful it. movie. Yeah, it is. Superb film, of course. But I kind of was able to put it out of my mind and still fall into the ambiguities here and what I liked about the movie is that it never really 100% at least to satisfy mm -hmm. me resolves the question is this the guy who went off to war is this another guy who looks like him and is very clever about the deception and I like that about well the that's film. why it's such a haunting story and it's of course I think we should say it's based on a true story though the story was set in 16th century France and what Nicholas Meyer who wrote the screenplay here is also known as a director of Star, Star Trek, Trek movies, movies and other right. things and, 7 solution. and a fine novelist what he's done in adapting this screenplay is to move it to the American Civil War era almost flawlessly. One of the things that's wonderful about this is the look of the movie. I mean, I, it calls to mind very often some of the paintings and lithographs of Winslow Homer of the era where you have uh, a, a very specific shots that resemble those paintings and then they have a, a wonderful touch where on the wall of the plantation they actually show a Homer lithograph. We should say James Earl Jones, who's a wonderful actor and is not above doing small roles in pictures he believes in as he did in Mate One, for example. Here has a role towards the end of the movie. It's a cameo, but it's unforgettable. And the thing I I like about Richard Gere is, I don't know about you, every time I see him act, I have the feeling in the back of my mind, don't always trust this guy. He has that kind of, you know, maybe it's because he was in American Gigolo or, or the one where he played the psychiatrist with Kim Basinger. Sure. That picture. Or Internal Affairs. He right. was very good playing a very and bad guy in that one. he's perfect for the role because you like him. He's a conventional, good-looking leading man, but there's something about there's him. There's just something about him. That's not quite He means that he's the perfect actor okay, for this role. Okay, and speaking about something about him, i got to ask you a question. What do the following movies have in uh -oh. common, right? Uh, the Bear. A River Runs Through It, Hope and Glory, and Summersby. As Sir Alec has said in Bridge on the River Kwai, I haven't the foggiest. <laughs> They're all great-looking movies, gorgeously shot right. by a terrific cinematographer, Philippe Rousselot, right. who deserves all credit, probably will get an Oscar nomination for this gorgeous-looking movie Despite well. the fact that it's opening early in the year. Of course, we're talking about Oscars a year from now. Yeah, well, terrific. It sounds like we have something we can actually recommend to people that we both like very much. Well, next up is Sniper, and this is a very different kind of movie. This is with Tom Berenger as a tough, battle-scarred Marine who's used his expert marksmanship on dozens of top-secret assassination targets. His latest job is to trek through the Panama jungle to knock off a rebel general. But Billy Zane, who's been assigned to accompany him, is a bureaucrat from the National Security Council who knows nothing at all about this kind of mission. I had a lot of SWAT training, all right? Urban anti-terrorist tactics, you know? I never actually done a creep. The Army ever put you in the jungle? It's called deepest, darkest North Carolina jungle, yeah. You want to survive this, right? One answer to that. You do as I tell you to the letter. I think you got a chance. Well, okay, hold on. Look, you may have a hell of a lot more experience than I do, but with all due respect, Gunny, this mission is NSC, meaning I still have rank whether you see it or not. Sorry, but I don't have to take orders from you. Fair enough. You want to take point? You're doing fine. Instead of the neat, tidy, long-distance assassination they planned, the two snipers get caught up in a huge and seemingly endless firefight with the Panamanian rebels, Colombian drug lords, and other assorted bad guys from Central Casting.
Well, I think you said it yourself. What's right about this film, at least what I saw it, is that not all these clandestine operations are these neat antiseptic missions you can be detached from, that you're really killing a human being. This is not the kind of movie I usually like, but mm -hmm. I found myself sitting back and uh, looking at it as nothing but a macho action film <laughs> for a certain kind of audience, and it delivers the, the goods. The Joey audience? Well, no, it delivers the goods. I've seen the trailers, which have been playing in theaters for months now. I think in, this was supposed to have an earlier release, and they maybe edited it again. And for what it is, don't look for messages, don't look for anything profound but it's got very good special effects and some good macho action Yeah, but scenes. don't What's look for entertainment that? value oh, I was either. I, I, I certainly wasn't. I mean, the problem with this film, it seems to me, is it pays more attention to the hardware than it does to its characters. It has great scenes of bullets traveling in slow motion, but that's all. which you, you see endlessly. There's no great reference to love for the gun or anything like He doesn't take it apart no, to talk how wonderful you it is. You see half the movie that. through the sights of a, of a scope, a long-distance scope on this, on this rifle. And the problem here is, like a lot of Hollywood pictures, this is overproduced and underwritten. You never find out anything about these characters. The whole movie is based upon this tension between them. They hate each other. But you don't know it, why. I didn't you don't know why they, they develop they're, more they're, respect they're, later. They're, they're, they're just because it's automatic. I think they're two different types of people who want the same thing. And if you want to look for some kind of Boy, human relationship, yeah, that yeah, but this like film isn't idea. supposed to be deep. You know, but, but it also, other but it films are overpraised. To, it's not supposed it to be supposed at all. It's to have nothing a storyline. A storyline. And there's nothing there. I mean, there's nothing there except endless trekking through the jungle and these two guys sort of fetching at each other, arguing with each other to uh, doing a movie review show, right? right? That's no, right. I think Tom Berenger is that very good in rugged... Live in the movie. This is his third uh, movie set in rugged locations, following Shoot to Kill and a yeah. play in the fields of the Lord. You buy the fact that he knows his way around the jungle, and Billy Zane is an upcoming star. You know, he's very good at Dead Calm. He was very good at Dead Calm. He's terrible. No, here. I didn't think so. I thought so. Berenger was okay, but Billy Zane is unconvincing. He looks very uncomfortable. He looks like he's, he's ready to, to look phone his agent for the check no, at any moment. come on. Don't look at it like you know, it's a Hollywood production. You know, the fact is, this is very slickly done. I will say that. It's well shot. It's by a Peruvian director named Luis Yosa. So it's and on target, right? <laughs> I wouldn't say it's on target. I th say it's a, a mixed success as his okay, Hollywood well. debut. Next up is our family fine portion of the show where we don't have Sniper to be sure. At long last, we can recommend, however, a new movie opening up at your local theater. It's a delightful comedy called Matinee, spoofing low-budget, quickie horror films of the 50s and early 60s. If you're of that age, and I certainly am, you might have grown up watching giant moths and man-eating vegetables in films later to be immortal by my partner here in his Golden Turkey books. And in matinee, John Goodman plays a schlock producer hyping his newest masterpiece back in 1962. Yes, the atomic bomb is terrible. But more terrible still are the effects of atomic mutation. Hello, I'm Lawrence Wolsey. And I want to warn you about something that could happen. Something that does happen in my newest motion picture. Observe the ant. A miniature marvel of social cooperation and prodigious strength. But if a man and an ant were exposed to radiation simultaneously, the result would be terrible indeed. For the result would be... Mant. I feel I should warn you. The story of Matt is based on scientific fact, on theories that have appeared in national magazines. Yes, these terrible events could happen in your town, in your home, and they will happen in this theater, in Atomovision, the new motion picture miracle that puts you in the action. Now, Goodman, the flamboyant producer, has come to the local theater in Key West, Florida during the fateful week of the Cuban Missile Crisis to test market his movie, and followed by a devoted young fan, he begins wiring the theater to enhance the movie's meager special effects, despite a skeptical manager. This is a national crisis that's going on. If you start vibrating the theater and putting things in the seats and scaring people... What is that? Tunnel Red, the Civil Defense Channel. They're tied straight into the distant early warning. If there's an attack, they will broadcast on this wavelength for full 90 seconds before we have local sirens. I, I really wish you... Anyway, you see what I'm saying. The country is on red alert. People are already scared. Exactly. And what a perfect time to open a new horror movie. Think of it, my friend. Millions of people looking over their shoulder, waiting for God's other shoe to drop. Never knowing if each kiss, each sunset 
Each malted milk ball might be their last. Finally comes the Saturday afternoon of the big premiere. It's a release form. It says it's not our fault if the movie scares you to death. Wow. It's not a joke. We've had ten-year-old kids having heart attacks at this movie. They're recovering, but we can't be exposed legally. Now, if you don't sign... But we're not scared. Are we, Dennis? No. Nurse! I cut my elbow! That looks terrible. Next! Well, that may look terrible, but this movie, as far as I was concerned, looked great. That's Kathy Moriarty, of course, playing the nurse who, surprise, isn't really a nurse. <laughs> She's very good. She's very good. She's really the producer's girlfriend in the story, also the star of his movie. Joe Dante, who directed this film, also directed Gremlins, knows this territory cold. He got a start in motion pictures at age 13, writing articles for Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. He has great affection, not only for this material, for the old movies, but for every character he creates in this movie, and that makes it a delight. Light. Well, I read they're going to make a new Godzilla movie. I hope for your sake they return to me <laughs> making these giant ants take over the world movies. You'll get three or four more books out of I don't know, Jeffrey. <laughs> what I liked about this film, much as I liked a film called The Projectionist uh, in the early 70s mm -hmm. with Chuck, Chuck McCann. McCann, right, it doesn't have any guile about it. There's nobody who's really made a fool of, no stooge here in the movie, and they didn't overdo themselves in their attempts to recreate the atmosphere of October of 62 during the Missile Crisis. Yes, they have the cars and the way people looked and the way people went to movies and the songs, but but somehow it seemed natural like I was really looking back on that time. Well, one of the things that I liked about the way they're promoting this movie even is they're saying that it deals with the three great fears of life in October of <laughs> 1962. Nuclear war, dating, and horror movies. And I love the way they show the big brother terrifying his younger brother almost sadistically. Actually, it brought back memories, guilty memories. I used to take my brother Jonathan, my kid brother, to the uh, Saturday matinee with me, and I would be just as sadistic as the kids here. I related to so much of this as a direct memory of that time. Uh, well, I don't know about you if you're old enough, but you always say that I certainly am old enough to you remember those are, right? idiotic drills we used to do the, uh, to, to avoid nuclear holocaust. You'd get down and put your hands behind your head, and uh, they do that in the movie, and they make fun of it. They show how ridiculous it was and what a different world the Cold War yeah, was. Absolutely. There's some affection for the innocence of the time, but there's a knowing affection about it. One of the things I think we should say is that there's one section of the movie where they seem to be making fun of those of us today who are worried about some of the messages that movies are sending and its impact oh, on the younger you? generation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But but, but the fact is that what they show is that the people who are protesting out in front of this movie, Mant, are actually hired by the producer to help publicize his film, which is based on something that really happened to an old-time promoter named Kroger Babb, along with William Castle and Burt Gordon, is one of the models for the John Goodman and character. And Goodman may promote schlocky films, but he's not a bad guy here. He's a good guy, and you want him to make it. That's why I like He's the a film. good guy, and it's a good movie, which the whole family will enjoy. Well, next up is a new feature for this week's show, when we call your attention to a video classic that's never quite gotten the attention it deserved. This week we recommend The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, an unforgettable 1978 dramatization of a famous poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge that nearly everybody studies in junior high or high school. Now in this version of the poem, award-winning filmmaker Raul Da Silva combines live-action footage, old engravings, stunning animation, and narration by the great actor Sir Michael Redgrave to take the viewer on a truly chilling voyage. The day was well nigh done. Almost upon the western wave rested the broad, bright sun, when that strange shape drove suddenly betwixt us and the sun. And straight the sun was flecked with bars, heaven's mother send us grace, as if through a dungeon grate he peered with broad and burning face. Alas, thought I, and my heart beat loud, how fast she nears and nears. Are those her sails that glance in the sun like restless gossamers? Are those her ribs through which the sun did peer as through a grate? And is that woman all her crew? Is that a death? And are there two? Is death that woman's mate? Her lips were red, her looks were free. Her locks were yellow as gold. Her skin was as white as leprosy. The nightmare life in death was she who thicks man's blood with cold. The naked hulk alongside came and the twain were casting dice. <laughs> the game is done. I've won. I've won. 
quoth she, and whistles thrice. Well, you get two for the price of one here because this video, first half of it at least, is a biography of Coleridge. Mm -hmm. If it's been years since you've read Coleridge, you understand what drove this man to write this incredible, timeless work, the crowning achievement of his life, once the second part of the video begins. It's yeah. a very good detailed and that, biography. And of that him. biography is so fascinating. I mean, it has details about Coleridge's relationship with William Wordsworth's sister, which is quite interesting. And, you know, famously in the 60s, everybody talked about how Coleridge took opium. Well, this puts that in the proper perspective. It is, by the way, a very psychedelic almost oh, yeah. visionary strange poem what this realization brings out is some of the religious elements the elements of damnation and salvation and and it's absolutely spellbinding to watch because it is so strangely uniquely originally realized with so many different video devices and the great voice of sir michael redgrave an actor unknown to younger generations comes alive here and you can see even though you can't see him what a powerful actor he must have I been i think in his even day. younger viewers are going to get something out of this video well next up is our screen by teen segment of the show where our young panel brings their perspective to a big new release at your video store starring Oscar winner Jeremy Irons. It's called Kafka and it's loosely based of course on the life of writer Franz Kafka in Prague in the early part of this century. In this movie the tormented main character who works as an insurance clerk is drawn into a nightmarish world of mystery and danger. <laughs> So, Kelly, how do you find Kafka? Lots of fun, right? Hey, Jeffrey and Michael, we just rented Kafka, which yeah. is a story that stars Jeremy Irons as an insurance clerk who discovers this whole conspiracy that involves body snatching in an <laughs> Eastern European town. I really liked it, and I thought it was an extremely effective, good, artsy, kind of haunting movie. What did you guys think? I don't know. I rented the movie because I was in a real intellectual mood, but it was so deep and dark and depressing, it just brings you down to the ground. I mean, half of it's in color and half of it's in black and white. And it took a long time getting to the color, so I didn't even care anymore. I hate black and white movies, and it even put my mom in a sleep. Yeah. Uh. Same with me. I, I just didn't understand this movie. I thought when I pressed play, I missed the first half I of it know, or something. I know. Like, what happened? And, um, <laughs> but the only thing I did like about this movie is the director, Steven Soderbergh, yeah, who did Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Really I thought he made some great artistic choices in this movie, but that was really about it for me. Yeah. Uh -huh. And also, um, Teresa Russell stars in this, Armin Mueller Stahl and Al Guinness, and they all did really good jobs too. Yeah. Well, Kenya and I really didn't understand this movie, and I don't think we wanted to, but Kelly liked it, and it's at your yeah. local video stores. Back to you, Michael and Jeffrey. Yeah. Well, now to summarize our reviews of the five titles we covered this week. Now, our sneak preview's best bet is Summer's Bee. This is a haunting, enthralling combination of romance, mystery, and historical epic with top-notch performances by Jodie Foster and by Richard Gere. Now, there are several tender but discreet sex scenes and one brief scene of a violent confrontation. We split on Sniper. Jeff thought it was a slick, macho action picture with fine performances by Tom Berenger and Billy Zane, but I thought it was dull and formulaic with no storyline and no characterization to keep the viewer's interest. Now, of course, it's loaded with foul language and almost nonstop violence, including some sadistic, unsettling torture scenes. Now, for our family find this week, we're delighted to be able to recommend a new movie that's opening up at theaters everywhere. It's called Matinee, and it features John Goodman in a nostalgic, fast-paced concoction that should delight parents, 
older children, humans, giant insects, teenagers, and all other life forms. Now, there is no harsh language or disturbing violence, and the only sexual content shows two teenage couples enthusiastically necking. Now, as a video classic, we urge you to rent or buy a stunning home video version of The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, and our Screen by Teens panel split two to one against Kafka, which was just released on home video, starring Jeremy Irons. Now, this nightmarish, surrealistic film is rated PG-13 for a good deal of graphic and disturbing violence. That's it for this week's show. Please join us next time for a special sneak previews where we look at the recent explosion of movies that deal with a subject that was once considered dangerous and taboo, love affairs that cross racial lines. We take a look at major movies featuring Denzel Washington and Kevin Costner and Michelle Pfeiffer and Whoopi Goldberg and many other big stars. That's our next sneak previews. I'm Jeffrey Lyons. And I'm Michael Medved. So until next time for our special show, Interracial Romance, don't forget to save us the aisle seats. Thank you.